Thank you for listening to this resource provided by Westwood Baptist Church. Listen as Pastor Steve Smart brings a message of hope in Jesus Christ. last week uh, I grew up uh, going to church I made that I think probably pretty clear but not only uh, but it wasn't out of some kind of uh, commitment it wasn't a covenant commitment that made me go to church in fact the churches I, I was thinking about it yesterday the churches that I grew up in uh, I had one pastor that I just kind of you know in ja- going through Jacksonville I had followed him kind of around uh, the city as he'd go the church that I grew up in usually had a rotation of past they'd move their pastors around in different locations and so I just kind of followed him but it was funny I was thinking yesterday the uh, all, all the churches that I attended following him around as a kid and as a teenager uh, didn't even have any kind of real membership structure that I knew of uh, they never talked about church membership never talked about anything like that I think you just you just showed up and you were a member I guess is how it worked I just went because I enjoyed it I went to church as a kid and as a teenager because I enjoyed it as I said last week my parents made me go so been it and it ultimately developed a good habit for me but church the gathering of worshipers should be more than just a good habit uh, it should be more than just a, an obligation because I feel compelled to do it or because I was raised to do this or because someone expects me to go. And when it comes to obligations, I think we'll all admit we have enough obligations competing for our time already. Uh, and, and it's just getting, getting more and more severe, this, uh, these conflicting obligations. There must be some specific value to gathering together. Uh, especially in the world we're seeing develop around us. A world of isolation, uh, independence, a world of seclusion. Uh, so what does the Bible say in that context? What does the Bible say about believers gathering together? Uh, in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, we see what, are, what, what I think, you know, we agree is the most, probably the, the first signs of the church gathering beginning to take shape as a covenant community, as a a group that that is there for a reason. Uh, It starts out in Acts chapter 2. I'm just going to read it for you. You don't have to turn there. In fact, our text this morning is going to be Hebrews uh, chapter 10. So hold hold there. But let me just read for you Acts chapter 2 and how this thing kind of, I think, began and where we begin to see this idea of the church gathered and what it's all about. It starts out in verse 42. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Now this is This is after Pentecost, after the ascension, and after the church's gathering. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Now, in that one verse, Acts chapter 2, verse 42, we see four areas of devotion in the early church. The first thing we see is they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. The second thing is they devoted themselves to the fellowship. Third... They devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. And then finally, they devoted themselves to worship. Literally, what he means by what what the word there is prosuke, it means the prayers. They devoted themselves to the prayers, to a structured form of worshiping together. And the result of their devotion was the community of faith that developed right there in that early, early group of young Christians. As we read further, Going into Acts chapter 2, past verse 42, in the next three or four verses, we see really three observations, I think, become clear. First of all, one of the things we find out about the early church, and again, you've heard me say it before, when you're talking about the early church, which early church are you talking about? Corinthians, you know, Galatians? Well, we're talking about the early church, the first one that we see an evidence of. 
I think there's at least three things that we can see about that particular early church. The first one is they were always studying the Bible or the apostles' teaching anyway, the scriptures. They were always studying and they were always applying the word to their lives. Let me, let me read it for you. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread and the prayers, and all came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. So you see, the first observation that we can see about what church gathered looks like is that there was this overwhelming sense that God was at work in the church because they were, con listen, because they were constantly learning the word of God together. Now, now there's a lot of reasons why we gather and a lot of different elements of a worship service. But the one thing that we see specifically as we observe the early church is that there was this overwhelming sense that God was there because they were constantly learning the scriptures together. The second thing, observation I think we can see about that early church is that they were committed to being together and loving each other. He goes on, he says, And all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. So you, what you see right away is there's a sense of a growing energy of community and fellowship among these young new believers. There was fellowship among, among them, and their fellowship with other believers became, now listen, it became the dominant activity in their lives. Very simply put, and just putting it out and let you know exactly what I'm saying here and what we observe is that church attendance became the one most important event in their lives. Above everything else, church, the church gathered was the most important, had the highest priority above work, above family obligations, above, now I'm not saying, you know, you know that's, I mean, there's all kinds of implications here. I mean, you have to be there every time the door's open. I don't know. <laughs> if it's that much of a priority in life, why don't we want to be? They did. They wanted to be at church all the time because Christianity is community living. In Ephesians, Paul says, so then you're no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's own, and he uses a very specific word here, household. But as we mentioned before, we live in an individualistic age. Much has changed over the past 2,000 years. Uh, much has changed over the past day. We live in an individualistic age, an age of seclusion, an age of isolation, I think contributing that, the largest contributor to that is the internet, obviously. It truly has helped us accomplish globalization, which has been, had benefits, but it's also had, had consequences. Internet and the globalization that's come from it has caused us to have an individualism about us that we've, well, we've perhaps never had before, at least intentionally. Even our the things that we have sewn to our hands, those cell phones, smartphones, text messages. People don't talk anymore. Uh, we just send a text. And, and, hey, guilty, I'm right with you. It's just easier, right? Rather than getting in a phone conversation, let's just shoot a text real quick. And I can say everything I want to say, and I'm done. But what does that entail? It means there's no conversation. It's just me telling you, and then you tell me a sentence, and then, and then we, but we never interact with each other. We never have the benefit of seeing each other. It's, I remain in my, in my little circle, and you and yours, but we're able to communicate that way. Uh, even fast food restaurants, uh, I think, have contributed to individualism. I, I mean, think about how it is. You know, you don't go into, like McDonald's, you don't even go into McDonald's. Who goes into McDonald's anymore? You just go through the drive-thru and sit there for 30 minutes. You know, you just, if you go to Chick-fil-A, you know, you've got your food before you even order it. So, I mean, it works out really well. But the point is, is that that's what drive throughs have done to us. We don't go in, we don't go in those places anymore. And if we do, it's, it's, a, it's a rare occasion. We just, we just go through the drive through Why? Because I can speak to a, micro, a, a speaker, stay in my car, roll my window back up, 
until I get to the place, stick my card out to somebody that has a mask on, and I don't have, we don't have any interaction there. She takes my card, gives it back to me, hands me my food, and I'm on my way. Do You see, what, even the smallest things of our life now are geared to individualism. Do you remember the day, some of you older folks, generationally, do you remember the day when sitting around the table was a thing? That you came home and, and that was how the family structure was, was meant, was we came home and we, we sat down and we ate dinner together or we ate lunch together or we ate a meal. Maybe it was only on Sunday afternoon, but there was a time when we, when we ate together. But now we just, it's just all individual. I'll get my thing, you get yours. It's all geared, all those things are geared to, and this is, this is important that we understand. All of this is geared to letting us be alone and still keep in touch with other people. Uh, Facebook. I've got friends on Facebook from 30 years ago that I didn't even know 30 years ago. People I went to high school with, I get a friend request. I never even heard of this person. I have to go to the yearbook to find them, and I'm like, I don't even know you. Okay, friend accepted. Because we can be together without having to be together. Twitter, Instagram, tech, all of those things. But, but, but here's the observation for us. Everything in the Christian life is intended to be done in community. Everything in the Christian life is intended to be together. That's why Jesus said, John 13, a new commandment I give you that you love one another. And even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. That word for fellowship, when it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, that word is koinonia. It's the word where it's koine. It means in common. In fact, their loving together included serving one another. Listen, it says they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as they had need. So, yeah, there was simplicity, but there was unlimited generosity. How do you serve one another if it's just you? For them, community meant serving one another. But it's this third observation, I think, that really speaks to our text this morning in Hebrews. And that is that corporate or gathered worship... It was a priority for the first church. He says in verse 46 of chapter 2 in Acts, he says, day by day, day by day, okay, they were attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. They received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily, day by day, those who were being saved. It wasn't just a Sunday 10 a.m. thing. It wasn't just a Sunday Wednesday thing. It was a Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and repeat on Sunday thing. Every day they were meeting together. In other words, there was this continuous commitment to meet together for worship, to assemble together. And that's why the writer of the Hebrews would eventually warn us. He'd eventually warn us, that because, warn us about this sense of gathering together because as time, and listen, as time separated the church in Acts 2 from the church that had grown and spread over the region, the importance of gathering together had begun, had begun to lose its importance. Something happened between Acts chapter 2 and Hebrews chapter 10. And the result was the importance of gathering together had lost its importance and, and listen, the result of which were grave consequences. So let's look at our text this morning. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 24. He says, let us consider how to stir up. In other words, provoke. The word there for stir up is provoke, stimulate. He says, let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. There's two verbs in those two verses that I think we need to draw attention to. The first is stir up or provoke and encourage. Stir up, the word for stir up uses the same root word that would be used to describe a coughing spell. That's what he's talking about here. The word for stir up is the same word that's used to describe a coughing spell. It's not an onrush of emotion. 
It's steady. I think that's very important for us to pause and think about. When he says, let us consider how to provoke one another, it's not how can we stimulate some kind of emotional response in one another. It's how can we keep stirring the pot and keep it going all the time. That's what he's talking about here. So when the writer says that we're to stir up one another, it would be to bring on, it would be to bring on an attack of emotional expression to make the heart beat for another Christian. That's what he's talking about here, to keep it moving. In other words, let us consider how to get each other motivated. That's his point. And he says, encourage one another. Encourage is parakaleo. It means to come alongside, to confront, to comfort in a time of need. Stir up one another, encouraging one another. Paul mentioned all of the, the, time, the occasions recently that we've had of how it is so important for the body of Christ to parakaleo, to come alongside one another. Many of you have shown your love and compassion to the Clark family, to the, the, uh, the uh, uh, Bowman family, to the Cross family, and so on and on and on, individuals, to the, uh, the Robinsons. I mean, we can, we can go list by list by list of people. And, you know, every one of those, we sit in the office when we get the news, and almost, almost invariably someone will say, I don't know how people go through life without their church family. That's what he means here. He says encouraging one another. Both of those, to stir up one another and to encourage one another, have to be done in the context of community. You cannot do these things by yourself. So in other words, God's word, now listen, this is important for us to wrap our mind around. God's word commands us to encourage one another, to live together in community. Don Whitney, who is a professor at the Southern Seminary, has written a book called The Spiritual Disciplines of the Christian Life. He made this comment, and I think it's very appropriate. He said, there's an element of worship in Christianity that cannot be experienced in private worship or by watching worship. There are some graces and blessings that God gives only in the meeting together with other believers. What possible benefits could there be? I mean, why can't I just get on YouTube and have my bunny slippers and just watch worship? Why isn't that enough? Well, there's some benefits, and I'm going to share those with you as we continue this morning. Here at least, I'm going to give you five, and I'm going to do my, I'm just going to be full disclosure here. I'm going to do my best to convince you this morning, and I realize I'm speaking to those who are here. But just because you're here doesn't mean you see necessarily the value of being here. I'm going to give you, I'm going to try to give you five convincing benefits to being here this morning and coming back next week and every week after. All right? The first benefit of gathering together, of the church gathered, is that, and it is a very simple. Number one, we are mutually encouraged. How many of us come into corporate worship feeling a sense of fog, spiritual fog? I think that's especially rampant among our young families. Uh, distracted by the morning's events. I know when our kids were small, it was just it was a, it was a major uh, accomplishment just to get out the door, much less get out the door on time, right? Because there's so much involved in that. And, 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 and so we come to worship on a Sunday morning and we're distracted. We're distracted by the events of the morning. We're distracted by work. Uh, we're distracted by the obligations that we're thinking about for the next day. We're distracted about family. Uh, we're distracted about money. All of these things are on our mind because that's just life. And so when we come together, we need to refocus. We need our spirits to fine -tune, be fine-tuned. Martin Luther made this observation he said at home in my own house there is warmth and there is no rather there is no warmth or vigor in me but in the church when the multitude is gathered together a fire is kindled in my heart and it breaks its way through one of the probably one of the one of the most I think strategic psalms in my life that answered a question that many of us have that I had was psalm chapter 73 
In Psalm chapter 73, the psalmist is asking a question that many of us have asked, myself specifically, and that is, why do the wicked prosper? Have you ever asked that question? You look around, you say, why? I'm sitting here doing it all of this on my own. I remember one time uh, when, when Cheryl and I were, were early married, and uh, we were, man, I was doing, I was in college, I was working a full-time job, I was working a part-time job, Cheryl was working, we were doing everything we could to make ends meet and, uh, and, and keep our bills paid on time. And I had this friend who had gotten into a multi-level marketing uh, business. And in this multi-level marketing business, it kind of struck a nerve on him, and he decided that he was, he, well, he was just going to go start living the life. Well, he didn't make any more money than I did, and he had just as many obligations as I did. And, and, but instead of meeting those obligations, he just started going out and buying stuff and claimed bankruptcy in doing so. That was part of his strategy. And I remember looking at him, and I'm struggling, and I'm trying to put food on the table, and I'm trying to make ends meet, and I'm doing things the way, and that's no glory to me. It was, if anything, shame on him because I looked at him, and I thought, why does he get to get away with this? Why does he get to, get to have a happy life? Why does he get to go on trips and, and all these things, and he's claiming bankruptcy? Why is he getting to be blessed? Because that's how I saw it. I saw this sense, and, I was, and there was a sense where I was so overwhelmed by obligations that I couldn't see it any different. All I could see was, I don't have, and he does. Anybody ever shared that experience? We do. Yeah, absolutely we do. And we look at the wicked, wicked and we say, why do they get to prosper? I'm doing everything I can <laughs> to do things the right way. And Psalm 73 is struggling with that. That's the struggle the psalmist is having with. Why do the wicked get to prosper? Why do I get to look at that? And he's discouraged. But listen to what he says, verse 16. He says, but when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to be to be a wearisome task. Until I went into the sanctuary of God. And then I discerned their end. And it made sense to me again. In other words... Being with God's people in God's house helped him think rationally about what's right, about what's true. When he was by himself, he was just concentrating on what he didn't have and what they had. But when he came together with God's people, it all started making sense and the truth began to become evident. Friends, the world is confusing enough. We need to be with each other to share the experience. We need to be with each other to help make sense of it all, to understand what's right and to recognize what's wrong. He goes on, verse 27, for behold, those of you who are far from you, sh those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who's unfaithful to you. But me, to me, it's good to be near, to be near God. Too often we do the opposite. We pull away from corporate worship. We get discouraged, we get hurt, we get bored, and we pull away from corporate worship. But what we need more than ever is to be awakened in worship. The warmth of being with others who share our love for Christ. So the first benefit is that we're mutually encouraged. The second benefit is that we're able to serve one another as Christ commanded. 1 Peter chapter 4 says, as each one of you, and we mentioned this was where we were at last week, as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Friends, if God has commanded us to serve one another, how are you going to do that by yourself? How are you going to fulfill that command by yourself? We have to gather together. We, in order to fulfill the command that God, and it's not a suggestion incidentally. God didn't say, hey, you know, I think it'd be a good idea if y'all can work it out, maybe serve one another. He said, serve one another. I've given you gifts. Don't let them sour. Put them to work in the assembly. I think a great illustration of that occurred in uh, Segovia, Spain, back uh, a few years ago. There's an aqueduct over in Segovia, Spain. It's a Roman aqueduct. It was built in 109. Now think about this. 
It was built in 109 AD, all right? 1900 years ago, this thing was built. For 1800 years to 1900 years, this thing carried water. From 109 AD all the way for the 18, 1900 years that followed, this thing carried water. They decided in their whatever logistic wisdom that they needed to give this thing a rest. So the government of Segovia, Spain decided that they were going to give these ancient bricks and mortar a reverent rest and they were going to retire it. Now, I want to make sure you understand. 1,900 years this thing carried water. Not a problem at all. Not a leak, not a nothing. It just carried water all the way through. They decide they're going to give it a rest, retire it, build something alongside it. Guess what happened? Immediately the thing starts falling apart. It starts crumbling. And all the bricks begin to fall and all the mortar becomes to deteriorate. Here's the thing. What took ages of service could not be destroyed. For 1,900 years, this thing could not be destroyed. It served its purpose. But as soon as idleness came in, disintegrated. Friends, that's how you and I are. If God has given you a gift and you just let it sit, soak, and sour and then slip out, friend, it will go away. It'll sour. We weren't intended to have these gifts so that, we could ha- so that we could keep them for ourselves. We're intended to give. So one of the benefits of worshiping together is you get to fulfill the command of God by serving one another. Three, our faith, when we gather together in corporate worship, our faith grows along with our intellect. You see, Christian growth is not just something that we take away as a sermon application and then work into our lives that week. That's not what it means uh, to grow as a Christian where I have a, a, a week-by-week experience or moment, and I learn something, and I go apply it. Tim Keller says this. He says, sanctification can happen on the spot. It's an interesting thought. He says, sanctification can happen on the spot as we sit under gospel preaching and engage it in corporate worship. In other words, when I'm sitting here under, under gospel preaching, biblical preaching, when Matt's leading us in worship and his worship ministry is telling us, hey, is he worthy? And we're singing back he is. Tim Keller says his experience has shown that he sees people being sanctified right there on the spot. It didn't happen through the week as it went through. People experienced God's changing power right there in the context of worship. How many times has the Holy Spirit taken the scripture read from that morning? Or a prayer spoken? Or a chorus that we sang? Or the truth that was preached and he pressed it right there in the heart of your need? I know it's happened because many times, many of you have come to me and said, Pastor, you are talking to me this morning. No, I wasn't. I've been talking to me for six days. You just happen to show up and get it too because that's what God does. He takes the word. He takes a prayer. He takes an experience that we have right here together, and he puts it right in the hole that we got in our heart, and he just rams it right in there, doesn't he? How many times has God spoken, and not merely to instruct us in our Christian walk, but to heal us in a moment of need? How many times have you come to, have you, have you ever come to church hurting, confused, wanting some kind of answer? And maybe it wasn't some profound thought, or maybe it was just one little word. And God brought healing. God does that in the context of worship. When we join in corporate worship, God won't simply teach us new thoughts. He'll change our hearts right on the spot. Number four, and this is a tough one I think we all need to wrap our minds around, and that is pride. Our pride is weakened and our humility is increased. Now, let me explain to you what I mean by that. In private devotions, we lead ourselves in some sense, right? Think about that. When I have, a, when I have a, my quiet time or I have a private devotion, I'm leading my worship, right? But in corporate worship, we're made to receive the leading of other people. 
When I sit in corporate worship, I have to be led. When I sit in my chair before the time I come up here, Matt's up here and he's leading me with you in worship. I'm not telling Matt what to do. He's leading me as we're going through worship, just like he's leading you. You see, corporate worship reminds us that our faith is fundamentally receiving, and it's not our own giving. In private worship, we're in the driver's seat. We decide what passage we want to read, when to pray, what to pray. We decide how to linger in Bible reading and meditation, what songs to listen to or sing, what gospel truths to preach to ourselves, what applications we want to consider and how we want to apply it to our lives. But in corporate worship, we respond. Others preach and pray. Someone else selects the songs. They choose how long to linger in each element. Someone else is in the driver's seat. And so we're positioned to ride, to receive. Now, don't get me wrong. Personal and private devotion is important. I'm not not dismissing or or discounting in any way personal and private devotion. That's not the point. But when we worship under the direction of others, there's a sense that we relinquish control. And we learn that part of worship is submission. Ultimately to God, but also to those that he has ordained to lead us. That while we are all priests before God, we don't pursue him on our own terms. We pursue him together under the leadership of others as he has instructed us in his word. Paul says, you said, well, I don't, I, don't, I don't know about that, Pastor. Show me. Okay, scripture and verse. Nolan, here we go. Ephesians chapter 4. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers. Why? To equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. So much of what is called worship today is really just building up of individual silos where I get to have a me and Jesus moment. And sometimes my silo is higher and bigger than yours. But gathering together puts us more on a level playing field where Jesus is exalted and all of us have a common sense of our need to worship him as we are being led by those he has gifted to lead us. This leads us to the final benefit. The final benefit of gathered worship, of the five, this is the one I think that's blessed, that when we gather together to worship Christ, there's this heightened experience of worship In the corporate context, number five, our shared joy is deeper. Joy is deeper when it's shared than when it is individual. Our own awe of God is accentuated. Our own adoration is increased. Our own joy is doubled when we worship Jesus together. There's an old Swedish proverb that goes like this, says a shared joy is a double joy. In other words, I can have a great time by myself, but when you and I stand together and we worship Christ, what greater extent of joy fills our hearts and our lives and it's accentuated in that context, you see, because in corporate worship, we uniquely enjoy a deeper, a richer, and a greater admiration and awe because our delight is in Jesus and it expands as we magnify him together with, other, with each other. The secret, and let me, let, me, let me preface this by saying, I've had, and this is no exaggeration, numerous people through my, the course of my ministry, conversations where people have asked me, How, why can't I worship like so-and-so worships? Perhaps you've said that before. They look at so-and-so and and they're raising their hands and they're closing their eyes and their expression is worship and this person's looking at them and thinking, why can't I have that? Why don't I have that kind of joy? The secret of joy in corporate worship is not only self-forgetfulness. It isn't the preoccupation with Jesus in his glory. It's also the joyful awareness that we are re- that we're not rejoicing alone. That others are sharing the same joy and the same loving savior. 
So it's not just me focusing on Jesus and having this me and Jesus moment. It's when I look around and I see you having one. And I'm encouraged by that. And I'm thinking, there really is something to this. It's not just a figment of my imagination. She's worshiping Jesus just like I'm worshiping Jesus. <laughs> so what are we going to do with this text? How are we going to apply this text to our lives? Real simple. Real simple. The best way to hold fast to our hope and faith is to be in the fellowship of his people. That's what he means when he says, as the day draws near. You see, as we draw near to God and hold fast to our hope, we're not to do it alone. God never intended it to be that way. An important purpose of our assembling is to stir up good works and love. Yes, we come to worship and praise God. And yes, we want to do those things in excellence. Yes, we want to have great musicians and good graphics and, and lighting and all those things. And praise God, he's blessed us with people who do that for us. And amen, that's great. We want that. But we do come to worship God. But we also come to edify and exhort one another. There's more to gatherings than just this hour and 20-minute experience. Therefore, we must not be guilty of neglecting to meet together. The word neglect means forsake. It means abandon or desert. So in other words, God's word commands us to appreciate the value and the necessities of our assemblies. And that for, now listen, I'm going to say something here. And I want, it's true. I don't want to say it, but it's true. To forsake the assembling of the saints calls our salvation into question. I'm not saying you're not saved if you don't go to church. I'm just telling you, if being with the people of God, John says in his first letter that one of the indications that you can know for certain that you're a Christian is because you want to be around God's people. So if you don't want to be around God's people, I'm not saying you're not saved. I'm just telling you, friend, listen to me when I say, and I say this with love, your salvation is in question because it's indicative of a potential apostasy because you're not living according to the Holy Spirit's presence in your life. There's no evidence of you wanting to be with his people. If we truly appreciate the blessings we now have in Christ, we'll do all we can to draw closer to God, to hold fast to the hope that we confess, and to seize the opportunities we have to encourage one another in love and good works by gathering together in worship. Boom. Amen? Now I realize I'm talking, preaching to the proverbial choir. You're here. I get that. But it's important that we understand why we're here. Because I want to remind you, as a kid, I went because it was fun. I went there because my parents made me. I went there. I had all kinds of reasons why. Some of you might be here because so-and-so expects you to be here. Maybe it's you expect you to be here because you did it all your life. And I'm telling you this morning, there's a better reason to be here than just obligation. You see, what Jesus does in our hearts is he changes us. None of us deserve his love. None of us deserve his compassion. God created us as a holy and righteous, loving God. We're the ones who shook our fist at him and said, I'll do things my own way. And we've carried that formula for the, all of our lives. For all these thousands now of years since our first parents made that first choice, we've replicated it as time goes on. And we've enjoyed it. We've justified it. But what the tragedy of it is, it's brought upon us consequences. The ultimate consequence is that we can't be in God's presence because that's sin. But there's so many other consequences that go along with that as a result of sin. There's, the, there's this, the consequence of death, losing our loved ones. There's a consequence of illness. There's a consequence of fear and worry. And all of those things are consequences. Why? Of what? Because God's an angry God? No, because we shook our fist at him and said, you do your things your way and I'll do things my way. And God said, no, it's not going to be like that. 
You go on, you do your thing, that's fine, but I'm going to stand true to what my expectations are, and you've got to be perfect. problem is none of us can do it because we all have blown it. But here's the good news. Not only is God a just God who demands justice be served, but he's a merciful God who has chosen to take upon himself the justice himself. And he has paid the price, the penalty, the guilt for our disobedience. Believing it's not enough, there has to come a point in your life where you say, I trust it. I trust what Jesus did for me. And let me tell you what he'll do for you, friend. When you do that, God will put a new spirit inside of you. He says all things become new when you're in Christ. He'll change your attitude. He'll change your thoughts. He'll change your wants and your desires. And he'll make it a joy to come be with God's people in worship. So if you're here this morning, you love being here, praise the Lord. Me too. If you're here this morning and you don't see the value of corporate worship, friend, be challenged. Let the Holy Spirit speak that truth to you. And if there's something between you and God that's standing in the way of you being able to be reconciled with him and enjoy the time with his fellowship, I can't plead with you enough to come to him with repentance and trust him and believe him and surrender everything you are to him and let him change your heart. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your goodness to us. We're thankful for, the, for church. We're thankful for this. I'm thankful for this church. God, I'm thankful that this church, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, sowed into my life and changed me in the trajectory of where I was going. I thank you that this church, through the ministry of this church, men like Bob Bell and, and, uh, and Jimmy Kaywood and Red Hester and, 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 and Leroy Bowman and all these men, Keith Habermas and Keith Goforth, I thank you, God, that I had this church to sow into my life and that through it, I was blessed. I thank you, God, for the churches I went to before here, for the pastors that preached truth to me, for the Sunday school teachers who showed up faithfully. I thank you for the worship pastors who taught me how to sing, not to myself, but to you, to honor you and give you thanks. I thank you, God, that... You gave me the privilege of being under the teaching of good preachers and teachers, but I thank you also that you gave me friendships in this body. I thank you, God, that those friendships endure, and I thank you that they have shaped me and molded me and encouraged me. And so I pray, God, this morning for the one who doesn't have that joy who doesn't see the value of, this, of, the, of the gathered church in their lives, I pray that from this day forward they'll start looking for it because they'll find peace in you. And then by doing so, they'll have the hope of gathering together with others who trust you. And so I pray for those who are here this morning who need, who need to be blessed by the church, who've been hurt by the church, who've been confused by the church perhaps. And I pray that they would do as the writer of the Hebrews says, fix their eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of their faith, and come and bring that attitude of service to one another. And I pray, Father, you'll bless our church. I ask you, God, to bless our church, bless our people, bless our congregation, our fellowship. Bless it in such a way that we're so filled with joy, people get tired of hearing about it, and they just want to come find out about it. And then take that joy to others as well. And I pray that in all things that we do, that you will be glorified. And this is my prayer, God, and I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to this resource provided by Westwood Baptist Church. 
While we are so glad you were able to listen, we encourage you not to allow this to take the place of you attending a local church. If you would like more info on Westwood, follow us on social media at Westwood Life or visit us online at westwoodlife.org.